Hello. Um, my voice is broken. My foot is broken. I have a cough drop in my mouth. I'm really sorry about that. I will probably also blow my nose during this talk. So you've been warned. Um, <clears throat> My, my yay friends make fun that they've never actually seen me at a con present at a conference where I wasn't sniffling. Um, but it did happen one time at Frontiers a few weeks ago, um, and then I got sick. So um, I'm Rebecca Murphy. I am a JavaScript developer at Boku. Boku is based in Boston. I am not in Boston, which is why I was able to dodge the hurricane entirely, thankfully. Um, but at Boku, we do a combination of um, JavaScript and web consulting and um, <clears throat> training. Training is what I've been doing a lot of for the last few months. Um, and also, we have real commitment to open source development and evangelism. So we get to spend a whole lot of our time um, when we're not doing training or consulting, working on open source projects. So it's a cool place. Check us out and check me out on Twitter. Um, my talk today is called <clears throat> It's called Writing Testable JavaScript. And it's not called Writing Tests, um, although we're going to actually look at, at some tests and what they look like. Um, but it's called Writing Testable JavaScript because a couple months ago when I started thinking about this talk and thinking about the workshop that I gave um, here a couple days ago and some other workshops that I'm going to be giving um, in the coming weeks, um, I asked people on Twitter, what's making it hard for you to get started with testing? And what a lot of people said was that they saw the problem as one of how to write testable code. You know, they hadn't even gotten to the part where, you know, I'm writing great code, but I don't know where to start with tests. They were really saying, I'm writing terrible code, and that means that I can't write tests. <clears throat> and people seemed to know or have some sense of what it was that made their code bad, you know, what it was that was making it hard to write tests. Uh, but they didn't really seem to know how to fix it. And so that's what I want to talk about a little bit today, um, is, is ways that we can rethink our JavaScript um, to make it more testable. And before we get started, there's, there's a few sort of facts of life that, that I think we should all agree on. Um, number one, there is some moment when you have a new feature that you have to develop where you sit down and figure out how you're going to approach that feature. You know, maybe it's, oh, I'm going to write a giant function in a document ready block and make some submit handlers or some, you know, some event handlers and call it a day. Uh, but you will design your code. The question is whether you will do it well. Um, as Remy just said, you will test your code. He tests his code. Reload, 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 reload. You will test your code. Um, you know, the, the opportunity here is to do it in a way that doesn't involve these two fingers, or I guess these two fingers over and over and over and over again. <clears throat> um, you will refactor your code, or you'll need to make some changes to it somewhere down the line. You know, we've all had that boss who says, you know, just get it done. Once it's done, this this never going to change. Swear. Um, they lie every single time, with the best of intentions. But you will need to revisit your code. You will need to make changes to it. Um, other people will need to read your code. Um, and they might hate you when they read your code. They'll hate you less if you have tests to prove that it works and to tell them what it does. And finally, the, the one thing that I want to make really clear when we're talking about tests is that there will be bugs. Tests are not a guarantee. You know, it's not that you write tests and therefore your code is perfect. The goal of tests, sure, is to help you prevent bugs or help you, help you avoid bugs, but there will be bugs. And the, the benefit of tests goes well beyond just preventing, avoiding bugs. Um, it goes back to that ability to des design your code well, the ability to refactor your code the ability for other people to understand your code and consume it with confidence. Uh, so in this talk, <clears throat> I love when the words, like, I hear them in my head, but they don't come out my mouth. Um, in this talk, we're going to take a look at a, you know, this has kind of been my go-to demo app. 
I spaced it up a little bit with Twitter Bootstrap in the last few months, but uh, this has been my go-to demo app for quite some time um, with various, various incarnations of it. But what this basically is is just a simple search application. You type in a word, you get a list of people. Um, you know, obviously, this all happens using JavaScript. We're not reloading the page. Otherwise, I wouldn't be allowed to talk here. Um, and then once you have this list of search results that match, the, um, <clears throat> that match the search term, you can click on this like button for a given search result, and it'll show up over in this liked area over on the right-hand side. Um, none of that like persists or anything, because that was too hard for me to write for a demo. So um, in, in a traditional you know, jQuery kind of world, don't worry that you can't read this. It's not important. Um, in a traditional jQuery kind of world, the, the code for creating an application uh, or a, fun a piece of functionality like this might look kind of like this. We get some elements and we do something with them. So the entire logic of this lives inside of a giant submit handler, like a 30 or 40 line submit handler. And inside of that submit handler, we were firing off an AJAX request, and we get the data back, and we throw it in a template, and get some HTML back, and then throw the HTML into our page. When it comes to verifying whether this code works, this particular style, uh, this particular approach, really the best thing that we can do, like the best we can hope for, is to verify the eventual outcome when I type in cat to search for cat, do I eventually see some matching results? Um, if anything goes wrong along the way, we don't really know where that happened. Our tests aren't going to be able to tell us where that happened. But you know, the kind of tests that we would write in order to do that kind of testing, the, you know, what was the eventual outcome? Was the eventual outcome correct? Did all the pieces work together? These are called integration tests. Um, they make sure, like I said, that all the pieces work together. And they're important. I don't want to dismiss them at all. Uh, <clears throat> Selenium is a great way to write these tests. Um, here's, Selenium, here's a Selenium test written in Ruby. Um, there's, there, Selenium, there's a Selenium uh, you know, package for Java and for Python. and for, There's even one for JavaScript. But sometimes you don't want an async API, and this was one of them where it was like, seriously? Because it was like the, the examples are like 50 levels of in, indentation to like see if something's on the page. So I wrote it in Ruby in, instead. But these, um, these tests, they, um, they are basically kind of simulating user interaction with your page. So the, there's a set of these tests, and they run pretty fast. Um, but this is all happening in code. That was code that made that opened up a browser, filled in a form, and then checked to see, do I see this? Do I see this? When I search for something absurd, do I get back no results? Um, when I click on the like button, does the right thing show up over on the right-hand side? So it's all automated. And if you get nothing else out of this, like write those tests. They're really, once you spend like, hour or two wrapping your brain around how, how to set up Capybara. Um, and I'll link to um, the code for this so you can just steal how I set up Capybara. Um, once you understand how to do that and you know, invest a couple of hours in doing that, you'll feel really stupid that you've been reloading your app all the time, because I felt really stupid that I had been reloading my app all the time to see if simple stuff was there. Um, but still, these, these tests, these kind of integration tests, they're more smoke tests. They're the kind of tests that you want to do maybe as some sort of milestone, maybe you know, before a release. Um, they don't help you write better code. They just make sure that your application still works. The kind of tests that I want to talk about today are unit tests. And these are the kind of tests that I think help you write, will help you write better code. Um, and it's interesting because the testing, there are other languages that have a really strong testing culture. Um, so the, the Ruby and Rails community especially has a very strong testing culture, test-driven development culture. Uh, JavaScript doesn't yet have a strong 
testing culture, but I'm hearing a lot more people interested in it. And I think that we're hearing more people interested in testing and in testable JavaScript because they're realizing that that code that they wrote five years ago is still around and they're still having to take care of it and when they touch it, it breaks. And they wish they had some way in place to, to not, to avoid that situation. Um, they're also, you know, we've moved beyond the world where we're just using JavaScript to make drop down menus and like show and hide and fade and slide things. We're writing real applications with JavaScript. When you're writing real applications, it really matters whether your code works. So unit, <clears throat> unit tests um, are, like I said, what I want to talk about today. And unit tests, whereas those, those integration tests, the Selenium tests are testing like, does everything eventually happen the way it should? Unit tests test units of functionality. And you're given this input, did I get this output? Uh, and, and the result of that, of writing unit tests, is that you end up with code that has to be written to accept input and give you output. You end up with code that has to be written so that you can test it in the first place. Um, so you, you end up with code that is safely refactorable, um, you know, it, because often, of course, we like write the first terrible implementation that works, um, and then we go back and make it better. You clean up the code, clean up the variables, clean up stupid logic, whatever. Um, tests let you do that much more safely. If your first version had tests to prove it worked, the same test should pass when you write your second version. Um, and finally, the unit tests and this might be my, my favorite part, is they clearly, they're a way to clearly state expectations that other people can have of your code. So if other people, you know, other people on your team, um, <clears throat> if it's an open source project, then, then other developers are consuming your code, then tests are a clear statement of, what, of how they can expect your code to behave. Because in theory, if your code stops behaving like that, your tests are gonna start failing. And there's, you, you know that you have made a breaking change um, or you'll fix whatever it is that you broke. So they're a great way to, to you know, codify the expectations that other people can have of your code and to demonstrate you know, how, how, the code can be, how code can be used. There was this project that was on Hacker News the other day. Um, J well, first it was jQuery URL, and it was like this library that depended on jQuery, like one method in jQuery. Um, and everyone like pounced on the guy about that, and so they made it like just JavaScript URL. Just a URL parsing library, which, anyway, point. Um, I don't know if anyone saw this whole conversation on Hacker News or, or why not. Point, this guy had taken, taken the time to write this like detailed readme showing every single method that you could call you know, on, the, on this library and what the expected output was of it. He had basically written tests in his readme, but he hadn't actually like, made them be tests so that you could run them and make sure that his library always worked that way. But that's basically all unit tests are, is given this input, do I get this output? That's what a unit test is. So if we look again at this traditional, you know, I use this word traditional, you know, nasty, wrong way of writing this, writing this functionality, um, then it's essentially impossible to unit test it because nothing, it's full of anonymous functions. It's, 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 there's no way to like test any individual thing in here because it's all just wrapped in this big submit block. All the functions are anonymous. There's no point where I can say, you know, there's no return statement in any of this where we can say like, did I get back what I expected to get back? Did what I expected to happen happen? The only entry point into this code is clicking that submit button. And so, yeah, the, the lack of structure to this code makes it difficult to test. This giant function. Also, there's a lack of configurability. All those selectors that you know, say this is the results area and this is the likes area and this is the search form. 
All of those are hard-coded, and so there's no way to configure that, which is something that's really important when you want to be writing tests. Um, a lot of state information is hidden, like the pending state, so you prevent people from like clicking on the submit button over and over and over again, is hidden, so you can't test whether that whole functionality works, whether you truly are preventing people from submitting the form over and over again. And finally, there's, there's a lot of, specifically in the, or particularly in the HX request, there's a lot of um, tight coupling going on. So it, in, in particular, yeah, so we talked about these hard-coded selectors, the giant um, submit function. Um, and yet this, this is a particularly worrisome to me because you're doing so many things um, that touch so many different pieces of this, you know, so many different pieces of functionality are all in these 10 lines or so of code. And my friend Adam calls this, I, this was, just go on images.google.com and search for choose your own adventure and like be a kid again. It was a blast when I found this. Um, but my friend Adam calls this kind of code, choose your own adventure code. I know that James used uh, choose your own adventure in a very positive way this morning, and then I was like, oh no, people are gonna think I'm contradicting him, I'm not. Uh, but Adam, Adam calls this um, choose your own adventure code, because on any given line, you don't know what's gonna happen next. Like, you don't know what, what the code might do next. Like, suddenly we're populating a div, and two seconds ago we were talking to a server. What happened? So if we want testable code, our first step is to, you can kind of tell that those are different colors, huh? Yeah. Um, that one on the bottom left is blue, the one on the bottom right is purple. Um, if we want testable code, then the first step is to disentangle you know, this is that first design step. In a minute, we're gonna get to the part where we write tests, but the very first thing we have to do is agree that we're not going to write giant event handler functions that do everything for us. We're not gonna have giant document-ready blocks that do everything for us. Um, and I think generally, you know, choose your MVVVPCT whatever framework of choice um, but generally, you can break functionality that we're writing in on the client side into these four categories. There's presentation and interaction. There's talking to the server or wh wherever your data is. Maybe it's in local storage. Maybe it's in a cookie. Um, but getting you know, dealing with your data, managing the data that governs like the business logic of the application. In the case of our application, that's the search results. The the like data search results, the search results data. Um, there's application state, which is more about like, what's my application doing right now? Like, oh, I'm searching for cat, so I better not search for cat again, because I just searched for cat, and the results are gonna be the same. Um, and finally, there's this setup slash glue kind of code that makes those other three pieces work together. So we can pretty much divide um, divide most of our client-side application development into these four categories. And if we look at our, um, our old code, our traditional code, then those four categories are kind of scattered you know, throughout. It's really like, mixed up. But we can think about it better uh, like this. So we have these three separate views, we have our search form, we have our search results, and we have our likes over on the right hand side. And then we also have on the data end of things, we have the actual search data, you know, the array of results that comes back to us from the server when we search for something. We have our application state, so like I said, what, what have we searched for recently? Um, and then we have the glue that gets all of this on the page and, and makes it happen. So at this point, we, we, if we've agreed that we're going to you know, write this in a, in a more you know, conceptually organized way and we're going to take a more MVC-ish approach to this, um, 
then we have some guiding principles for how we can start writing, actually writing this code to make it testable. Um, we can use, instead of you know, get some elements and do something with them, we can use constructors that create instances. So we can create an instance of a search results view. We can create an instance of a search form. Um, and when we use constructors to create instances, this is what we're going to do in our tests, is we're going to just keep creating new instances and seeing if they do what we think they should do. Um, that's a lot harder to do with a get some elements and do something with them kind of approach. Um, we're going to support configurability so that if we want to put our pieces of code into weird states, uh, we can. Um, so we're going to pass in the selector that we want to use for our new search results view. Backbones views, of course, do all of this for you. Um, I very artificially did not use Backbone for this because it kind of makes it a little too easy. Um, but you know, Backbone lets you say this view is for this um, this view is for this element, and that's a thing that you can configure when you create a new instance of the view. We're going to keep our methods. We're going to use methods on these instances. You know, these instances will have individual methods, and they're going to be very simple. They're going to be a handful of lines long. They're not going to be 30 lines long. They're going to be a handful of lines long. They're going to take some input, and the outcome of, of that input should be predictable and something that we can test. And finally, we're not going to intermingle responsibilities. Those four circles, we're going to keep them separate. We're not going to have our you know, search results view also going out and fetching the data. We're just going to give it the data and make sure it does the right thing. We'll have something else, some other piece of code that actually goes and gets the data. And we'll make sure that it gets the data the way that it should get the data and that it you know, processes the data so that it is ready to go to the search results view. All that said, there's one thing that's not on this list that we can do to guarantee that our code will be testable. And that is to write tests first. If you write tests first, you have no choice but to write code that makes the test pass. And a lot of people get <coughs> a little bent about this, and I don't have time to write tests. I don't have time to write tests first. And, um, I don't always do it. Like I won't lie, I don't always write tests first. Um, but I do think it's a good thing to try and feel what it feels like to write the test first because it puts you just in a completely different frame of mind to have to think through what do I expect this thing to do? And then to write those expectations in code before you write the code that actually does it. Completely different frame of mind. And one of the coolest things that will happen to you as a developer is you take the test first approach, you write a bunch of tests, you write code that makes the test pass, and then you fire up your application and then it works. It happens and it is like goosebump time. Like it's very exciting. Um, so for no other reason than I, I you know, just so you experience that, you should at least try testing first sometime. Uh, but I really do think that it helps as well with the design process. And it does, it guarantees that you're going, you're not, you can't write terrible code if you write your test first. It's like you just, you, you can't. So we're going to take a look at some tests for our app. Um, apparently, my talk description said these tests were going to use Mocha, which was a lie. Um, but I think Mocha is great. And it's a long story why I didn't use Mocha for these slides. I think Mocha is great. I think you should use it. These slides use QUnit um, style tests. Um, it's all the same thing, but Mocha is better. So, um, Water, look at that. Um, so for the, for the likes component over on the right hand side, the likes view over on the right hand side, here's kind of what our old code for this looked like. 
Um, you know, we, we have hard-coded selectors and we're good people, so we stored our selections in a variable because that would be wrong if we didn't. But then we had like, we even used event delegation because that's been around since jQuery 1.4 and we're using the on method and everything. Um, so here we're saying when someone clicks on the like button, which is in a totally different component that's over in the search, re the search results part, when someone clicks on the like button, figure out what the name is and then tell that liked region to add a new name to it. Um, and so you, you have these two, these sort of two separate areas of the page um, communicating with each other. That is, this is tight coupling, this is bad. So what we can do instead um, is, well first we're gonna say that we want to be able to construct a new likes view um, and point it at the element likes, or the, the element of the idea of likes. Um, so this is the, the dead simplest test that we could possibly write for this, is you know, when I ask this, when I ask my code to create a new view, does it? Now until I write the code for app views likes, this test will fail. And then, so the first thing I would do is go write the code that let, allows me to call new app views likes. And then this test would pass. And we'll see that code in a second. But I wanted to show you like, this is the stupid simplest test that you can write aside from like, okay, true. Um, <clears throat> which is what like half the examples of testing on the internet are, and it's a wonder that no one knows how to do it. Um, so uh, getting a little bit more real and um, actually testing something useful here, um, what we wanna do instead of just like having some code that just depends in LI, we wanna have this view have a way that we can tell it to add a new name to itself. And so, like, this is where I'm making a design decision. I'm going to have a method that lets me add a new name to this. And so I'm expecting that when I make a new view and I add the name Brendan Eich to it, then I'm expecting that I will now see Brendan Eich in the element where I created this new view. Again, I haven't written any code to actually make this work, so when I run this test, this test is gonna fail. But when I do write some code to make this all work, it's not very complicated. You know, here's my, I'm using an immediately invoked function expression to return the likes constructor function um, and giving the likes constructor function a add method. Um, now maybe later I choose to rewrite this or I'm like, I decide that I'm going to not use jQuery anymore and so, um, I, for this in particular, I'm gonna do it just with regular DOM methods or whatever. I can come back and refactor this. My tests should continue to pass, even if I change the actual details of the implementation of this add method later. So that is a very, very simple example of how we write a test that says, this is the API that I want to create. This is what I expect will happen when I call it and then I write some code that makes that test pass. The search results view, um, again, in the traditional implementation, we were fetching the data um, and then populating the results area with that data. And we were also, you know, go, we had, uh, you know, the data we got back had a results property and so then we were capturing that results property and passing that into the template and et cetera. Um, what we want to do here instead is, again, new up a view, put it in the results area, and then we want to be able to, again, say, here's your data. And then once I give you, you know, here search results view is your data. Given this data, I expect to see Rebecca and Dan in you when you're done. Um, and we could, uh, I had to keep the code so it would actually fit on the slides. We would probably do a bit more robust testing like do I see the email address, do I see the company name. We could even test like are they properly marked up if we want to. There's a lot of other things we could, we could test here but 
most simply, we're testing, like, do I see Rebecca because I added a person named Rebecca? Do I see Dan because I added a person named Dan? And do I see two results because I gave you two results? So again, we haven't written any code yet. We've only written our expectations of what this code will do. Our implementation um, looks like this, except that should be set data instead of set. Um, our implementation looks like this. Uh, again, not a whole lot that's complicated. You'll see here that we're using this load template thing, which is other code that's in the actual repo. <coughs> um, we're, we're using this load template thing. That's, that's a case where, um, again, the implementation inside of this might change, but our expectations, we, we use the test to state our expectations so that if we change, if load template changes or we decide not we decide not to do this using a template and we go back to the old world where we used to concatenate strings in our JavaScript. Um, if we decide to do that, then we have tests to prove that we did it right. <clears throat> Notice though that there's nothing in this implementation about fetching the data. Our view is just receiving data and using it to update itself. There's nothing in this about actually fetching the data. For that, we create a separate. Um, component to a separate module, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> um, the, this, the data side of things is completely separate. Um, we want to make sure that it hits the right URL when, you know, given a search term, do we ask, do we look to the right URL for the data? But what we don't want to do, this is, there's a couple things that we don't want to do when we're, when we're writing tests. Number one, we do not want to test the server. We should have tests for the server that's the server's job to test the server. We should not be testing the server. You know, we should not be testing, like, does the server give back the right thing? Um, we should not be testing libraries. So we should not be testing, when I bind a click event to an element using jQuery, did the click event get bound? Like, that's jQuery's job to test that. So we don't want to test the server. We don't want to test libraries. There's this great library called Sinon, Sinon.js. Um, that gives us a way to basically temporarily fake XHRs. Um, so in our setup for these tests, we can say, use this fake, um, fake XHR, and then when we're done running the tests, go back to using the original XHR. Um, so we can also, with this, we know that this is going to be an, this fetching this data is going to be an async operation. So we might want to say, hey, I want to make sure that when I fetch this data, I get back a promise. So we do want to make that assertion that I get back a promise. And we might want to say that because what comes back from the server is messy and we want to tidy it up before we pass it on to anyone else, we can check out, make sure that we're doing that, make sure that our code is doing that. Um, and we again can use sign on to provide a fake response. So sign on, nothing ever goes out to the server. We make a request and then we say, hey, sign on, respond to this with what I know the server is going to respond with. And then we test that our search results, um, our search data component actually returns what we expect it to return. <laughs> from that. And so here's the implementation for that. Again, you'll notice that often there are actually more tests than there is code. Um, generally, over, a, over the expanse of a project, you'll probably end up with somewhere around a one-to-one -one correspondence of, tests, of lines of tests to lines of code. Um, but for any given file, that, that you could have far less or far more. Um, but the great thing is that like, once you write these tests, the code writes itself. Like the code just, I, I don't know, I find it does. The code just like, it's so obvious what the code should be that sure, yes, you're writing more lines of code because now you're writing eventually a line of test for every line of code. But in reality, because you've done that like mental homework of, of writing that test in the first place, Writing the code is just sort of an, an exercise in obviousness. Um, I find that for me. So, 
Um, where to start with all of this? Um, there is a fantastic tool. You know, I, I would have been scared to give this talk a year ago, or God bless, two years ago, because the tooling around all of this just was painful to set up, and it's, it sucked. Um, and now there's grunt, and now it doesn't suck. Now it's, like, I saved just the last six minutes to talk about it because that's about all the time that it needs. Um, Grunt is a JavaScript um, task automation tool. The great thing about it is that it's JavaScript, so you already know how to write JavaScript. You don't have to learn Ruby. You don't have to learn Python or Java or whatever. Um, so it's a, it's a node package, a node module. Um, you install it globally, and then you get magic on your computer. Um, so by default, Grunt works with QUnit, um, but there's a plugin called Grunt Mocha that you can use for Mocha. You should just do it. Um, both of them work with PhantomJS, which is a headless browser, basically. Um, not basically, it is a headless browser. And what that means is that you know, when I showed the Selenium tests, that actually opened up a browser and ran them in the browser. Um, with PhantomJS, it just runs like on, I don't know, somewhere, not on your screen, which is lovely. Um, so it runs very fast. Um, it's just a process that, that kicks off and runs um, like WebKit, but without a UI. Um, and so they both use that. Uh, setting that up is actually also pretty painless. There's also Grunt Jasmine. There's sign-on, which if you are doing anything with anything asynchronous uh, or anything that deals with communicating with a server, rather, then you're going to want to use sign-on. Um, and if you're using Mocha, which you should, um, then Chai is an assertion library. So it gives you a way to say, assert this is true, assert this is true. It gives you like the API to make assertions. Because Mocha weirdly doesn't come with, it's complicated. Uh, Mocha doesn't come with an assertion library, so you'll want to pull in Chai. There's also expect.js. Um, anyway, Grunt makes all of this really, really easy now. If you have a project, you just say, you know, in that directory, grunt init colon grunt file. It'll ask you some questions. It'll make you a grunt file. Um, you know, put grunt.js in your, in your uh, directory. And that grunt file, again, not important what it says here, but that grunt file looks a whole lot like this. Um, so it just has some basic configuration in it. Um, in particular, it has this line that says, this is where my test, this is where my tests are. Um, and if your tests are somewhere else, you can change that and, and um, point it at your tests. So you say, this is where my tests are. And then once you write your tests, is it running? Yes. So this is my test for this application running in PhantomJS using Grunt. Um, and you can set this up as a, as a task that just runs anytime your JavaScript files change or anytime your test files change. So it will just automatically happen. Um, and when there are errors, it will let you know about it. So I mean, that's the hard part of this now is writing the test. The hard part of this used to be getting started. But now the hard part of it is really just like doing the part that you can't get around. And like, there's no way to get around writing the test. That part we can't like automate away. Um, but Grunt makes it incredibly easy to run those tests and run those tests in a way that um, doesn't interrupt your workflow and doesn't really even slow you down that much. So you can you know, incorporate them into your development process. The one thing about tests is if they are hard to run, you won't run them. Um, Grunt makes it really, really easy to run them. So you'll find yourself running them all the time as a post commit hook, CI, whatever. Um, finally, that's for Phil. Um, he really wanted to be in my slide deck. I don't know why, but he really did. So now he is. These are the links um, on my pin board, and there's a zip file. Um, the zip file is on my pin board too, um, but there's a zip file that has this whole project 
um, with all the tests, with the Ruby um, Selenium specs, um, with the node server that gives you the data and all that. I think it even has a README. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm Rebecca Murphy. Tweet me. E my email's not there, but you can find it. So email me if you have questions and stuff. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>